occupation, violence and racial segregation. All religious communities unite. Freedom is a human right. Orange peels, crushed crackers, and it's speeding along dusty ridge road. Gonna turn left, go down, go up again. Turn right on the West Hill. Bill Sam always smelled of wood chips. Uh, I don't have a memory. I don't have a clear memory of a specific moment where music became important to me. I think it was a process. So I didn't come from a particularly musical family. In fact, my mum and dad's record collection was very small. Um, but my best friend's older brother took music very seriously and he played guitar very well. So I think it was him who um, planted the seed of an idea that maybe I could play guitar, that maybe music was something that I wanted to take seriously and to pursue. It's an interesting question for me because I, I ha I've never really been asked that question before, but I, I think the truth is that, I mean, I started to try to write songs or to write music, at least, when I was quite young, when I was a teenager. And I think the reason is because I was kind of lazy. I, <laughs> I wasn't one of those guys who wanted to learn everyone else's song. You know, I mean, of course I did learn some other songs. Of course I copied other guitarists and so on. And I played in a covers band when I was 15 years old, as um, most of us did. Um, but yeah, I always wanted to kind of do my own thing, actually, from quite an early age. I'm sure most of it was rubbish. You know, I'm, I'm not suggesting for a moment I was particularly good at it, but I was always interested in trying to do something original, yeah. Um, a couple of things happened that opened my mind. Um, one of the things was that I, I had a part-time job in a guitar, well, it wasn't just a guitar shop, in a musical instrument shop. And most of the music I was being exposed to was, was good, but not particularly experimental or avant-garde. But one of the guys, a guy called John Seagrote, uh, was very experimentally minded when it came to music and it was him who introduced me to free improvised music it was him who introduced me to kraut rock you know bands like Noi and can it was him who introduced me to some really interesting early acoustic blues music and so on the second thing was that when i got to london i became aware of a group of improvising musicians who were very much the, they were very much kind of carrying the torch from the, the most important improv scene that Britain ever had, in my opinion, which funnily enough came out of Sheffield in the north, in the north of, of England. But there were a bunch of musicians, there was the guitarist uh, Derek Bailey, uh, the drummer John Stevens, um, there was a saxophonist, I mean, you know, saxophonist called Evan Parker. There were a group of guys who made this most incredible improvised music. I mean, coming out of jazz, but it, was, it wasn't really jazz anymore, it's this improv. When I got to London, um, that scene had sort of found, had taken root in a, in a college um, uh, called Community Music, originally set up by the drummer of that band, John Stevens. And I went along to a bunch of workshops and, and they would do crazy things that would force you to reinterpret your, your relationship with your instrument. You know, play your instrument but not using your hands. Or, um, do, you know, all these things, all these things that, um, that at first seemed s silly, bizarre. I mean, you know, pointless. But after a while, you understood that, that what they were trying to do, what they, you know, and what they were trying to do, I think, was to make you think outside of the box, to, to really approach music um, 
with a sense of playfulness and uh, a, a vastly expanded imagination and so on. And so that was very important for me too, that avant-garde scene that I, that, that I discovered when I moved to London mm -hmm. in about 1994. Well, I joined Faithis in 96, actually. So it's, I was only, only two years later. Between, um, between moving to London and joining Faithless, I, I was playing with all sorts of different people and I had a job in a record shop um, and, you know, j j just trying to survive. It's expensive. It's an expensive city. It's, it, it was even then. Um, so, you know, just kind of hustling, just trying to survive. But I, I, I worked for a singer-songwriter called Jay Fisher. I worked with a, a, another singer-songwriter, a woman called Pauline Taylor. It was her who introduced me to, um, to Rollo Armstrong and the people who would, who would set up Faithless. And of course, Faithless started in the studio. It was only when they had a hit that they put a live band together mm -hmm. and they kind of scooped up all the musicians who were knocking around that studio at the time in North London. So Pauline was one of them, I was another. And the original drummer was an old friend of mine from, from Essex, Matty Benbrook, and so on. Dido was another, Rollo's sister, who of course went on to become bigger than Faithless, at least in terms of record sales. Um, so yeah, it was a, that was my lucky break, yeah. I mean, I left the band for a few years um, because I wanted to record an album and promote an album of my own. That was the first Slovo album. So I left for a few years. I, I did the Slovo album, the first one, Nomo. I toured with Emiliana Torini, the great Icelandic singer, um, and did, did a bunch of other things, but um, didn't make much money, you know. And therefore, when I had a phone call about four years after leaving, three or four years after leaving Faithless. So this is 2004 now, when I had a phone call from Sister Bliss saying, it didn't really work out with the guy who replaced you, would you consider coming back? I said, yeah, yes please, you know. <laughs> yeah, that would be fine, yeah. But going back to Faithless in 2004 or thereabouts, was great. I mean, they'd gone up a couple of rungs of the ladder. You know, they were playing bigger venues, the, the backstage kind of uh, thing was, was more luxurious, you know, it was, it was fun. It, what can I say? It was fun. I mean, I always loved being with Faithless. Um, the very last tour in 2011, 2010, 2011, was um, there were one or two disagreements that crept in. I mean, I'm not just me, but several of the band members had disagreements with a few things that were going on. But, but yeah, in general, that whole run, 2004 through, th through to 2011, you know, we probably did about three, three world tours during that period, three albums or so. It was great. Yeah, I loved it. I was a teenager. I was already completely into music. Like I said to you earlier, I was um, working in the local guitar shop. I, I, I actually went from that to, be, to being, a, a, I was a, a, a roadie for a local band, a local rhythm and blues band called The Hamsters, who were brilliant. So it, as a teenager, I was going all, all around the country in a splitter van, lugging gear in and out of venues and selling t-shirts and tuning up guitars and so on. Um, but one day I, I was at a festival and the DJ played the tune Free Nelson Mandela, which was a big tune over here. I mean, I had no idea who Nelson Mandela was, but I kid you not, by the end of the first chorus, I knew that I wanted him to be free. Um, it, it, you know, surrounded by these festival goers hollering the hook of that song, Free Nelson Mandela, I thought, wow, this is something. Uh, this is something exciting and compelling. Um, it not only got me interested in the politics of South Africa, it also made me think that maybe ordinary people could do something to influence 
politics. You know, it made me think that maybe, maybe the future is unwritten and maybe music is our weapon in the struggle for a better world. You know, it, it was, that was a key moment for me. And that happened when I was a teenager, when I was, I don't know, 14 or 15 or something like that. An experience I had in 1997, the first time that Faithless went to South Africa, Nelson Mandela was still in power. So, I mean, apartheid had only just fallen, a matter of, what, three or four years prior to that. So we were visiting, as a multiracial band, visiting this um, long-boycotted, newly liberated Brainbow Nation. This felt like an incredibly, incredibly exciting thing to be doing. But then I discovered that our tour was very visibly sponsored by Camel Cigarettes, that really and truly, from, from their point of view, our job was to, was to peddle their brand, was to peddle cigarettes in, in the newly liberated South Africa. And that really made me realise that, that was one of the moments that made me realise that if I want to understand the relationship between music and politics, you have to dig deep. I mean, you, you, it's not enough to just say, yeah, we were on stage looking the way we wanted to look, saying the things we wanted to say. It's like, well, okay, but what surrounded that? You know, who's sponsoring it and why? What's their agenda? And so that was a key moment for me and it, and it got me thinking about this whole question in, in some depth. Despite the best examples, like Beyonce at, at, uh, at the Super Bowl last year and so on, a lot of artists are afraid. There is a lot of self-censorship and it's for good reason. I mean, when the Dixie Chicks from Texas, when they spoke out against the Iraq war, when they said at the Shepherd's Bush Empire, just down the road in West London, that they agreed with the protesters who were against the Iraq war at the time, the protesters here in Europe, uh, and, that, and that they were ashamed that the president at the time, George Bush, was from Texas. The crowd in London applauded. You know, they thought this was brilliant. But the moment that that incident got reported in the US, the song that they had in the Billboard Hot 100, whatever it's called, plummeted. Concerts were cancelled. Their records were sort of, you know, broken and binned by TV companies and record stations right across the States. They paid a huge financial price for that political statement. And people noticed. I'll give you one example of somebody who noticed. Madonna. Madonna uh, was just about to release American Life. In the original video for American Life, um, she's got all these scenes essentially condemning the Iraq war, essentially, you know, traumatised dancer soldiers in toilets and, I mean, the, the video literally ends, you can find this video still uh, on the internet, it ends with Madonna throwing a hand grenade at a George Bush look-alike. I kid you not, it was extremely political. But the moment that she saw the backlash against the Dixie Chicks, she canceled that video and shot a new video, which was completely, um, you know, there was no politics, completely banal. It was her singing the song in front of lots of different national flags. You remember it. So yeah, there's a lot of self-censorship. When I was trying to figure out what I was involved with in the early days of touring, in the early days of being involved in a successful band, in the early days of composing my own music and so on. Uh, and, and at the same time caring deeply about the state of the world and politics and all these things. I would have liked a book like this to exist. There were some books that I read that were very helpful. Frank Kofsky's Black Nationalism and the Revolution in Music. Um, the books that I subsequently read by Sidney Finkelstein and Ernst Fischer, but these are all quite old and obscure. You know, there, there wasn't much that I could find that really brings together these case studies of music and politics interacting in interesting ways, case studies that I could learn from, case studies that would inform my music and my activism. There was nothing out there. And therefore, I hope that my book is useful to people like the young me back then, now. I hope it's useful. I hope it's something that people who want to make the world a better place and who happen to be cultural workers, 
specifically musicians, but I, you know, I mean, music fans as well. I hope it's helpful for them. I hope it gives them some ideas about how they can take their vocation, their craft, their passion, and, and use it as a weapon to make the world a better place. And I hope it also makes them aware of the way that they are being influenced by power in, in, in discreet ways that we should become mindful of in order to, re in order to resist. You know? So, so I, I hope it will contribute to a whole number of things. Um, this is just my little contribution, but I hope it will be part of a bigger picture that will help to wake us up and get us on our feet and building a movement capable of changing the world. That's what I hope. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I mean, you know, this this has always been something I've done um, in my spare moments because, of course, I, I play music to pay the bills, um, compose music to play the bills, occasionally teach. I mean, all these things. I still tour with different people. But you're absolutely right. Now that my spare time is freed up again, you know, because I've written it, I've finally written it, and I'm very proud of it, and I hope that your viewers will consider getting hold of a copy. But now that I've done it, I am indeed going to go back to uh, creating some music for fun initially. But yeah, I've got lots of ideas that I'm excited about. I'm working with a brilliant drummer from Venezuela. I'm, I'm probably going to be working with a fantastic singer from Mali and, um, you know, watch this space. I've got loads of exciting ideas and I'm, I'm yeah, I'm excited to get back to Music, yeah. I'm gonna say something that isn't my number one necessarily, but something that was influential for me in a sort of an unexpected way. And, and I would say um, Arnie DeFranco's album, Dilate, because, I mean, maybe it was partly because I was sort of falling for someone who introduced me to her music, that always helps. But Arnie DeFranco at the time, I mean, I think she's made some bad calls politically, but, um, but at the time I thought she was quite bold politically. She's a great guitar player, a great song, songwriter, very honest lyrics, very sort of, I don't know, I just think she's, she's got such integrity and such, um, such a disarming way of kind of writing lyrics, a dis disarmingly honest and direct way of writing lyrics about love, about life, about political questions. And so, yeah, that's the unexpected favor, or the, you know, the sort of the under the radar, the, the, the thing, the album that maybe your viewers won't have heard of. Um, it was, yeah, it was important for me at a certain period of my life was, was Dilate by Arnie DeFranco. <laughs> status quo. The band Status Quo from Britain. Wow. I'm not ashamed at all. But you know, but that's the uncool band. True. That's the uncool band who um, are politically uncool. They look uncool. Um, you know, there's nothing groundbreaking about them. But I think, I don't know, they just had a kind of... Um, I mean, there's this thing about status quo. People would take the piss out of status quo saying they've built their whole career on three chords, you know, the one, four, five, rock and roll progression, gang, 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 gang. But the Ramones built their whole career on two chords <laughs> and they're super cool. So, um, so yeah, my, my guilty pleasure is status quo. Wow, that's, that's a tricky one. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like, um, I don't want to sound like a hippie, JS, but, um, but I, I don't, you know, I feel like it's all been, it's all been, it hasn't all been good, but I think it's all sort of got me to the next place, you know. Um, in my personal life, I, in my personal life, I've definitely made mistakes. But even those mistakes in my personal life, even those have kind of get, got me to the place I'm at now, which, which I'm very happy in my personal life. I'm very happy in my professional life. I haven't got lots of money. I haven't, you know, but I'm really, I'm really grateful to be where I am. And therefore I wouldn't, 
it does sound cheesy, I'm, and I'm sorry about that, but I, I kind of don't have any regrets, really. I don't, you know, I've never gone so far off track that I haven't found my way back. Yeah, I, I, I've got one. I've got one. Doing this interview with you after, t <laughs> after too many Brixton beers. Um, yeah, let it be noted. We, we've, we've been out in Brixton, my hometown. This man's taken me out and um, I wouldn't usually do an interview like this. So if I sound a bit slurry, it's his fault. 